Hey everybody, this is uh, this is Jansen. Uh, I'm the director of. Sorry, hang on one second. Yeah, so I'm the director of marketing here at Artelon, and so uh, we're gonna get started pretty much on time. I've got seven o'clock on my watch, so just first off, I wanna wanna thank everybody for finding their way to a, to a computer or a laptop tonight. Um, I, I'm pretty aware that there's no shortage of webinars that you can uh, jump on to um, currently in the situation we're in. So uh, the fact that you chose to, to spend some time with us, I, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I intend for this night to be worthwhile uh, for everybody. So a few things I do want to just highlight on the way in. Get us all on the same page. First off, I'm going to push a poll out. Uh, this is really our our the intent of this is is for us to just learn as much as we can. We're all locked up in houses, so anything you can do to communicate you know, what's what's happening in your world um, is helpful for us to understand uh, your business and, and you know things that are happening out there. So um, if you get a minute while I'm getting everything introduced, uh, please uh, click on the poll and, and, uh, and share what's happening in, in your world. The next thing I, I did want to highlight, we're, gonna, we're not going to do a, a, a live audio Q&A. Uh, it, it's just so difficult to manage the sound and the, the noise and that sort of stuff when we do um, Q&A live. So this is a good time to figure out where your Q&A tab is. It should be on your whole menu bar, your control bar. In the Q&A tab, you can submit questions at any time during tonight. Uh, our intent is that you, you know, throw everything at us. Where we've got um, Dr. Newfeld and Dr. Kudaka here to, you know, help you figure out some things. So uh, don't be shy. Please use the Q&A uh, tab to submit questions. And then just specific to the sales professionals on just a heads up. Tomorrow you're going to get an email with a link to this and in that there will also be a quiz. For those of you that um, decide to participate in the quiz, there is, um, there's prizes much like last week so uh, for, for you know great scores. So just have an eye out for that email tomorrow. And then honestly the last thing I wanted to hit, let me come back, this is just information sharing. Uh, we, I think personally, it's a bit of a struggle to understand really what, what's available and, and what cases are happening, depending on where, where you are in the, in the country. Uh, and, and I think that inconsistency of things has, has challenged everybody. So uh, this is the latest that I can find from the American College of Surgeons. They, they've given some guidance on, on various disciplines. Uh, relevant to us and maybe specifically relevant to Ardalon. There were uh, four, four things that they highlighted as being um, still places where um, Ardalon's people and or technology may still be needed to be helpful. And so just as an awareness, please don't view this as a, as a reason to go make a, a sales call tomorrow. We want to be very sensitive to what's, what's important right now. But I think from an awareness standpoint, understanding that uh, new lower extremity injuries with inability to weight bear, teller tendon ruptures, quadricep tendon ruptures, and, and specific to night Achilles tendon ruptures are still considered things that need to be uh, dealt with sooner rather than later. So just, just have a heads up, be, be ready and able to, um, to help if, if, we, uh, if we get asked. So. Um, I'm going to leave the poll up for just a little bit longer and introduce Dr. Newfeld and Dr. Cuddock. Uh, all right, let me get to the slide. So, um, Dr. Newfeld and Dr. Cuddock, I think we're, we're a couple of the first surgeons that I met coming on board uh, at Ardalan, and it's I've learned a ton from them. They're always ready to help. Um, help me understand things, help me share information, that sort of thing. So just been really lucky to be um, associated with both of them. So they are partners out of um, 
the Centers for Advanced Orthopedics, they count, they home base in Falls Church, Virginia, the DC area. Uh, but their group is, you know, really covers uh, DC, Virginia, and Maryland, big chunks of that. So they're, they're a big, big team. Um, but they, they're based out of the DC area. A little background, Dr. Newfeld's residency was done at Ohio State. He did a foot and ankle fellowship at Union Memorial in Baltimore. Uh, after getting his education done, uh, he was he founded and is currently still the director of the uh, Foot and Ankle Fellowship at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center that falls under the umbrella of Centers for Advanced Orthopedics and based there in the D.C. area. He's remained in education. He's a clinical professor at the or in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Virginia Commonwealth, uh, as well as a clinical instructor at Georgetown uh, Department of Orthopedic Surgery there in uh, D.C. as well. His partner, Dr. Kutika, completed his residency at Doctors Hospital and Grant Medical Center in Columbus and then followed that up with a foot and ankle fellowship with the OFAC group there in Columbus as well. Uh, he's in his uh, moving into practice, he's created a, a great practice and he's a peer reviewer for FAI uh, as well as foot and ankle specialist. And he's also remained in academics as a as assistant professor of clinical orthopedic surgery at the Georgetown Medical School. Together, uh, they've, they've been utilizing Arlon's products for right at three years. Uh, and, and I think of particular note tonight, uh, over that period, they've really seen the gamut of Achilles injuries. And that's what I'm excited about tonight uh, as far as uh, hearing their experience with, with those injuries and, and um, unique ways they, they've found to treat those um, in their own experience. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and roll into the presentation. Just a technical note, the presentation, uh, we went ahead and pre-recorded it yesterday just to avoid any technical challenges that sometimes arise in these. So don't be uh, alarmed if the, the sound from of your speakers doesn't necessarily match, you know, Dr. Neufeld or, or Dr. Kutika's, uh mouth on the screen. We're not trying to create the next bad lip reading video, um, but we, we went ahead and recorded this ahead of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit play. They're gonna be with us live. Uh, submit your questions and at the end, uh, we'll, we'll try to roll through everything that's, that's on your mind. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, today, Dr. Cutter and myself are gonna talk about how to take care of and fix Achilles tendon problems. We're going to talk about the traditional way of fixing them, and we're going to talk about uh, the new way that we are using modern technology to improve our reconstructions and improve our results and ultimately improve patient care. Our group became interested um, when we learned about this new technology from Ardalan um, because it seems to fit very, very well into our practice in the foot and ankle. And we've been using it all over the foot and ankle. Uh, and particularly around the Achilles tendon region, which is what we're going to focus on today. Let's spend, a for, let's spend a few minutes over talking about what Ardalan is and why it's been really revolutionary and a game changer for soft tissue reconstructions around the foot and ankle. So Ardalan as a company itself has been around for a very, very long time with over 20 years of clinical experience. Started in Europe with over 40,000 patients treated worldwide. Uh, lots of publications and peer reviewed uh, articles uh, makes this very, very unique product coming from a very, very unique uh, company. The product we're going to talk about this morning uh, is their flagship material called Ardalon. It's a copolymer implant and it simulates uh, ligaments, tendons, uh, you know, soft tissues. So it's flexible, it's very, very strong, it can load share, it promotes tissue ingrowth, and it's fray resistant. And unlike suture material and other implants that can cause reactions, we found that it creates a very, very little reaction, if any, and it eventually will break down, uh, not with an enzymatic breakdown type mechanism, which can cause an inflammatory response, more of a, of a glycolytic uh, reaction. The idea is that um, this material, how it's manufactured in different shapes and sizes, you can see on the bottom, anywhere from 0.3 centimeters to six by nine centimeters, can be implanted in the body, can be incorporated into a tendon or soft tissue reconstruction for strength 
and repair and not cause any complications such as reactions. Some of the advantages of FlexBand, as we, I just mentioned, it addresses the inherent problem that orthopedic surgeons have when we fix these, these tendons. And the problem is this, if you fix something, you don't want to immobilize it for too long because it leads to atrophy and weakness. And we know that early loading of a tendon, early loading of a bone, early loading of you know, orthopedic repairs is important for healing. However, if you load the repair, if you load the Achilles tendon, if you move the Achilles tendon too soon, you may risk gapping, you may risk tearing, and therefore your surgical repair uh, will fail. So there's always strikes a balance in your <clears throat> mind with how long to mobilize somebody versus when you start early range motion. Unfortunately, this Artelon has really changed the game for us and it's enabled us to start moving people right away and not worry about the gapping and the tearing that we would have uh, before we used it. It's been shown that Artelon is 92% stronger than suture alone. And the traditional repair of Achilles tendons, as we all know, is using sutures whether it's a non-absorbable or absorbable suture, uh, suture has a finite amount of strength. Adding Ardalon to it uh, increases the strength dramatically. Studies have shown that by eight weeks, the strength of the Ardalon repair is equivalent to the original uninjured tendon. So the data is very compelling, especially the fact that in this 2018 study showed that it promotes repairs, you can uh, tension the repair well, and that you're gonna have a strong repair by eight weeks. So this is just sort of a general slide that you can look through. And the reason again why we at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center and orthopedic surgeons all over and foot and ankle specialists like this material is because it does restore stability and natural motion. Uh, so it's not like a, a rigid uh, internal brace type fixation which doesn't move, this actually allows motion. It resists the degradation. It doesn't break down in a, in a quick amount of time. It's a slow, slow, uh, breakdown. 90% of its strength is still there after the first year of healing. There's no inflammatory response. There's no rejection that you see with other types of implants. And finally, this material allows natural tissue regeneration through load sharing. We know again that as an Achilles tendon goes through its load, the tenocytes and soft tissue remodel around it. And by four to five years, this artelon is integrated and completely replaced by the natural Achilles tendon. So uh, it's a very, very uh, forgiving and desirable uh, material. Let's look at some of the common uses around the Achilles tendon that uh, we've used Arnalon for. First, we'll talk about traditional treatments of Achilles tendon ruptures. Obviously you can do non-op or not operative, but for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna talk about uh, operative repair of these problems. Theoretically, the advantage of operating on Achilles tendons that it decreases your rupture rates, there's greater plantar flexion strength, and you have a significantly faster return to sports and activities. And I think even the studies that uh, are coming out these days looking at conservative versus operative treatment of Achilles repairs, it's clear that if uh, the Achilles tendon is fixed, people return to their sports and activities is sooner. Now there's debate in the literature on whether you do minimally vases versus open repair, and the literature could be confusing. Fortunately, there was a, a meta-analysis in 2018 that compared these two approaches and showed that there was no difference in re-ruptures, whether it's minimally invasive or open repair. There was no difference in sterile nerve injury. Uh, that was one of the concerns about minimally invasive that you may hurt the sterile nerve. There was no difference in return to pre-injury level. And the only thing they found significantly was that there were less wound problems with smaller incisions, which you know inherently makes sense. The goal of, of fixing an Achilles tendon, whether it's minimally invasive or maximally invasive or however you want to approach the Achilles, is you want that tendon to heal in its physiological, physiological position. If you tension it too much, it could be too tight. If you don't tension enough, it could be too loose. You really want to restore the, the normal dynamic muscle function as best as we can. We like to delay these repair by a few days to let at least the swelling come down. And we make a post-remedial approach. And as you can see on this uh, top slide on the right, this is a typical crack out type suture using a non-absorbable uh, uh, repair. On the bottom, however, are cases that we frequently run into where if you have a repair in a previously tendonotic or diseased tendon, your repair is gonna be tenuous. You leave the operating room thinking to yourself, man, this just was not such a good repair. I'm a little concerned. 
And these are the cases you may think to yourself, well, maybe I won't let them start early range of motion. Maybe I won't start them on early active and passive and weight bearing physical therapy. And these are the cases when uh, the surgeons are thinking, well, I think we need some sort of grafting or augmentation that may be desirable. So up until the, the advent of Arnalon, we had some choices. And we're going to talk about some uh, acute repair cases uh, using this novel technique. Dan? Okay, so for our acute Achilles repairs, we have been using the uh, box weave technique uh, with the Ardalon FlexBand product. So there's actually some good science behind this uh, technique. This was uh, based off of a cadaveric study uh, by Berlet and colleagues uh, in 2014. Um, in this study, they compared the failure load of Achilles repairs with and without augmentation. So they had, uh, just to briefly go over the study, they've had, they had 10 match pairs. One group was a four strand Krakow suture only uh, repair group. Uh, the second was the suture, but augmented with a box weave collagen xenograft. Interestingly, what they found was that the mean load to failure was significantly higher, four times higher in the augmented group. But I think more importantly, uh, with cyclic loading, the gapping across the repair site was significantly smaller in the augmented group. So, so you can conclude from uh, their data that the augmented group Achilles repairs uh, provides not only a stronger uh, repair, but decreases any sort of gap resistance that uh, can potentially develop. So I think this, you know, in, in real life is important because as we go to try to rehab patients uh, faster and faster and uh, try to get them back to return to activities and sports. We want to be aggressive with our rehab without compromising the repair. So that's where this uh, comes into play. So just briefly going over the technique, you're going to do your typical uh, standard Achilles uh, repair, do your running, locking uh, suture of choice, your circumferential patenon suture to reinforce it. And then when we do the box weave, uh, we make two uh, trans Achilles tunnels, uh, one uh, proximal to the repair, uh, second tunnel that's going to be distal to the repair. Initially, you're going to uh, pass your flex band uh, through the proximal tunnel, as you can see in this picture here on the right. You're going to bring one strand distally and pass that through the distal tunnel. And then you take that distal band and bring it proximally. Uh, and that's what creates your box. Now, the nice thing about the Ardalon is that you can actually, as you bring that uh, distal and proximal, you can, it's flexible. So you can pull on it and tension it, and it's still very, very strong. So you could tension, you know, as you seem fit, and you just suture it back um, onto the tendon proximally. Um, so you can see it does not add a lot of bulk because the uh, graft is, on the medial and lateral borders of the tendon, so not dorsally, uh, uh, which is a place you don't want to add a lot of, a lot of substance. And then I think also it does not pull through the tendon as you tension it because it tends to grab the bulk of it just proximal to the suture. So it tends to be a fairly uh, simple, fairly reliable uh, way to reinforce the repair. Next slide. Here's a case of a 42-year-old male who suffered an acute rupture uh, playing basketball. He had your classic uh, findings of, you know, felt he got kicked in the back of the leg uh, while uh, playing. Um, on presentation, he had your, again, classic findings of a, an acute rupture, a palpable defect at the watershed region. He had no Thompson sign present and with no plantar, resting plantar flexion. So the treatment wise, we elected to go proceed with uh, surgical treatment. You can, uh, he did have a fair amount of tendinosis present, so uh, that uh, did have to be excised and it did leave a two to three centimeter gap. Uh, that came together very, very nicely. And this was augmented, as you can see here, with that uh, box weave uh, uh, technique. And it provided a really, really good, strong, uh, predictable uh, repair. Okay, let's, uh, let's switch gears um, to chronic Achilles ruptures. So as you, as you saw, uh, the. Ardalon material is excellent for augmentation and reconstruction of acute Achilles tendons when uh, it is needed. Uh, chronic uh, Achilles ruptures is a more challenging problem for orthopedic surgeons. 
And it really comes down to how large the gap is. Now, if the gap is short and small, which very rarely do we encounter, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Then you could maybe do an end-to-end -end repair. Uh, number one, that is unlikely to occur because by the time they usually come to um, your doctor's office to get it fixed, it's been there for quite a while. And number two, frequently these chronic ruptures occur in, in situations with tendinosis or by the time they are uh, operated on, most of the tendon has been diseased and is really unhealthy. And an end-to-end -end repair is very unsatisfying and uh, does not really give you a nice strong reconstruction that makes you comfortable to allow early rehab. Other options, if end is not possible, is to reinforce your repair. You can do a turn down flap, I'll show you a picture of that in a second, a VY advancement flap, or obviously tendon transfers, both out, uh, autographed and, uh, and allographed. Uh, really the uh, workhorse in managing these defects is some sort of FHL transfer, as you can see on this bottom, where it's taken through the same incision and inserted into uh, the calcaneus. Uh, notice it's a very large incision, very large exposure, or adding a uh, VY lengthening, such as the picture on the left, with a nice slow advancement of your uh, Achilles tendon, or some sort of turn down procedure to manage these defects. But these are, these are challenging uh, procedures and uh, difficult to get good fixation and difficult to feel comfortable at the end of these repair uh, without some sort of augmentation. And there's other things, allografts and different types of grafts. And in 2018, in uh, the Journal of American Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, reviewed the different types of treatments for these chronic ruptures and, and essentially concluded that they were considering the relative paucity of these cases, the relative few number of really good studies, there's no evidence-based data to guide any specific treatment. So really the cat's out of the bag and, and it really is surgeon dependent. And in our, in our hands, our solution has been to go to this augmentation using our which we're gonna talk about in a second. And we've been very happy with those uh, repairs. So here's the uh, case, uh, Dan. So again, I think you, like Steve said, you take these on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. Here's one case do you take these chronic ruptures on a case by case basis? Here's one case of a 68 year old male, a uh, very active male, sustained an injury, um, an Achilles injury while playing tennis uh, three months prior. You know, presented, uh, you know, did not seek treatment initially, but eventually presented with swelling in his Achilles, you know, palpable defect with some, some kind of uh, thickening um, along the rupture site, um, no Thompson test and no resting plantar flexion. Because of the chronic nature, an MRI uh, was performed and it did show a complete rupture of his Achilles in the watershed region with about three centimeters of retraction. So after a long discussion, we elected to proceed with uh, surgical treatment. Uh, intraoperatively, as you can see on these, uh, in these photos, there was a complete rupture of, it, of his Achilles in the watershed region. Uh, but with these more chronic ruptures, there's usually a fair amount of uh, scarring and fibrosis of the tendon present. Um, so all that has to be excised. Um, so after excision of all his uh, fibrotic tissue, there's about a three centimeter uh, defect, as you can see on that picture on the right. So in this case, uh, luckily, uh, because the defect was not significantly large, we were able to uh, reapproximate uh, the tendon ends. There was good excursion of the tendon um, and allowed for a nice end-to-end -end repair. Now, because of the more chronic nature of it, because of some degree of the, uh, uh, fibrosis that was present, I think it's important to make sure you have a good, strong repair. You don't want any of that creep or gapping that can occur. So this was augmented uh, with the flex band box weave technique. Now, you can kind of see in uh, image two where we, again, passing that um, flex band uh, proximal to your repair, um, bringing it distally and then passing it through your uh, distal tunnel um, in images three and four. And that's what gave us, you know, kind of a nice strong repair. Um, and it, because we're fairly confident with it, you don't have to slow him down in terms of his rehab um, in this case. Here's a little bit more of a difficult case, a 27 year old male who suffered a traumatic Achilles rupture uh, from a forklift uh, injury. The forklift batch actually ran into the back of his leg, lacerated his Achilles. So he did undergo primary repair. Uh, unfortunately, he developed a uh, deep infection uh, postoperatively. 
uh, which required uh, multiple debridements. And obviously, unfortunately, you have to excise the uh, infected portion of the tendon um, to eradicate the infection. He also underwent six weeks of IV antibiotics. Now, we took him back for delayed reconstruction. Obviously, no evidence of re residual infection, but there's a very, very large defect, a seven centimeter defect. Obviously, there's no way you're going to be able to uh, reapproximate that or bring those tendon ends together. So, this was a case where uh, we did do an FHL transfer uh, to reconstruct his Achilles, but um, he did have a decent excursion after releasing any adhesions. He did have decent excursion of his uh, uh, proximal uh, tendon. So uh, it was felt that the boxing method to reinforce uh, the reconstruction would, would allow for a little bit of a better outcome. And um, you, know, you can kind of see here, we uh, use the flex band to uh, really almost bridge the gap, um, just augment uh, the repair, uh, which uh, came together fairly, fairly nicely. So a difficult case, but a nice uh, option to have in your uh, armatorium. Let's, uh, let's move on to another chronic problem that we run into in the foot and ankle world. Uh, very, very common, and that's non-insertional Achilles tendinosis. So this is a diseased, thickened, painful tendon. It's uh, bulbous, warm, swollen, uh, painful mid-portion of the tendon that the majority of the time, as we all know, you can treat conservatively with rest and, and uh, physical therapy and mobilization when necessary and, you know, modalities and maybe even regenerative medicine techniques. But um, ultimately, <coughs> when these end up needing surgery, uh, they do pose a challenge for the surgeon. And there's lots and lots of papers and lots of different techniques on how to fix this. But in general, after awaiting a reasonable amount of conservative time. You want to resect the degenerative tendon because we know that that area of the tendon is avascular and has little potential for healing. So you want to remove the tendinotic portion. Most of these cases have a tight gastroc associated with it. So you'd want to consider lengthening the gastroc. And then you're left with the dilemma of how to repair the tendon what's left. Now, if you resect too much of the tendon, uh, because you have to if it's disease, um, then um, what do you do? Do you augment it? Do you do a tendon transfer? Um, really, it's, it's uh, up to the surgeon and it, it's really an interoperative decision sometimes. Um, if you plan ahead and you uh, look at the MRI, you can sometimes predict that your repair is gonna be tenuous. Um, and that's when you can plan to do some of these augmentations. And this has been really a very great time to use uh, an Arlon type of uh, augmentation. So this is the dilemma. You see a patient on the left with an MRI finding that has at least 50% or more of changes in the Achilles, thickened, unhealthy, um, all the signal change. And in the interop, you open it up and it's that fish mouth, uh, that, that white, uh, fibrous, non-excursion type tendon, it's unhealthy tendon. And once you're done respecting that tendon, and you repair it like I did on the bottom there, you leave the operating thinking, well, you know, how much that tendon is really healthy? How much did I leave that was good? How much, how strong is my repair? And it makes you a little bit nervous about your rehab. And again, we talked about it's important to get these people moving as quickly as possible, prevent adhesions, promote growth. And in this case, this would be a perfect situation for some sort of augmentation. So let's talk about a case where uh, we've used that. Okay, so this is a 44 year old male with uh, chronic non insertional Achilles uh, pain. Been going on for about a year. Now, he, he's a well controlled uh, non insulin dependent diabetic, but no other uh, significant findings. And again, I tortured, or I tortured this guy for a year of uh, uh, non surgical uh, treatment. And that's with you know various forms of immobilization. Uh, an extensive amount of physical therapy focusing on eccentric stretching and strengthening um, modalities, um, anti-inflammatories, even uh, PRP injections, uh, but he just did not respond. Um, you can see his imaging of his, his MRI on the right. You can see that fusiform thickening uh, of his Achilles tendon in that watershed region. There's also some very, fairly high signal uh, changes consistent with intrasubstance tearing. Uh, so because 
he failed such a prolonged course of non, non-surgical treatment. We went ahead and proceeded with surgical treatment for him. You, you do your standard posterior medial approach uh, uh, to the tendon, and it's right over the area of thickening. It's usually fairly, fairly obvious in these patients. It's important with these uh, chronic tendinosis patients to not disrupt the blood supply because it is that watershed region. So don't dissect circumferentially, uh, leave the anterior blood supply intact. Um, and then you typically just incise right over uh, the area of uh, tendinosis into the tendon and, and book it open. And once you kind of book open the tendon, it's usually fairly, fairly obvious uh, the the kind of that mucinous degenerative tendon that, that you're going to see. And all that has to be excised. All that degenerative tendon needs to be excised to, to good, healthy tendon. Um, and again, the health or in the healthy tendon will look, you know, kind of nice elongated uh, striations, uh, parallel fibers, which sometimes it takes a fair, fair amount of excision uh, to get to. Um, um, next slide. Um, so in some cases, uh, or actually in, in most of these cases, you do end up having to take a lot more than the degenerative tendon, uh, sometimes unexpected. And, it, and in the old days, we'd always, um, or that would often require an FHL transfer, which um, you know is a, a significantly uh, larger procedure. Uh, and again, not a benign procedure too. There, there are certainly complications that can develop uh, from that. So it tends to, um, so we started using the Ardalon flex band uh, more as an inlay for these cases of uh, non-insertional tendinosis. And you just lay the tendon within, or excuse me, lay the, uh, you just lay the flex band uh, within the tendon and incorporate that into uh, your repair. So that's going to uh, really augment uh, your repair, prevents the need for any uh, FHL transfer, makes it, a, or makes it a much less invasive uh, surgery. Uh, and then I'm, you know, we're still very, very confident in, in um, the repair because of the mechanical properties of your artelon, the tissue is also going to grow into it. Um, and then we'll still weight bear these patients fairly, fairly early and proceed with our functional rehab because I don't think it really slows these patients down. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, another common problem that we see around the Achilles tendon, uh, and that would be insertional Achilles tendinosis. People describe this as a uh, pump bump or a Haglund's deformity in some cases, but it describes a situation where the insertion of Achilles tendon is diseased and it's chronically torn and it's an unhealthy tendon. The body lays down calcium, develops these calcium deposits, usually intra tendinous, intra substance. Sometimes you get large bony outgrowth. And on the left hand side, you see that this uh, a prominent bone can interfere with shoe wear and pain. Typically it's associated with a tight gastroc, so that's something you need to think about when we do the surgeries and you lent them as well. In general, the traditional approach to these would be to debride the diseased part of the tendon. Majority of the time you have a bursitis in the retrocalcaneal bursa region, which is inflamed and irritated. You resect that as well. If there's a prominent calcification, you resect that. If there's a prominent Haglund's process, resect that. And typically the tendon has to be peeled off the back of the Achilles tendon to do the work and to the, remove the disease portion. And you have to reattach it um, at that point with anchors or with screw with drill holes or the surgeon's choice. Now, for severe cases, when you're peeling off that Achilles tendon and most of the tendon is diseased and unhealthy, the workhorse and the traditional way to fix this is using an FHL transfer. And for you know my last 20 years of practice, that's been my procedure uh, to go to if I if I have to uh, resect significant amount of the tendon. However, the FHL transfer is not a benign procedure, as uh, as Dan mentioned. Uh, in my practice alone, I've seen uh, problems with nerves. I've seen heel pain. You know, when you take that Achilles, when you take that FHL and you run it through a tunnel with a bio screw or some sort of anchor in the calcaneus, you can get calcaneal stress fractures and you can get heel pain for quite a long time. You have weakness of the hallux and that's been shown in various studies. And it's not, and it's a big procedure. You're making a, a what could be a small procedure into a much larger procedure. Though there are studies that show, you know, good satisfaction, functional recovery, 
Um, more recently, there have been some studies that show that for older patients over the age of 50, which in my book is not old because that's where I fit, uh, they don't do well with an FHL transfer. So, you know, the answer is out. And, and um, in the orthopedic literature 2017, the recommendation was really a, it's a grade one recommendation to do an FHL transfer, which has really had showed that there's very low level of evidence. So that may not be the answer. And, and really maybe the answer is what we found uh, is to use Ardalon augmentation. And let's talk about uh, that in some cases. All right. So, so here's a case of a 42 uh, year old female who's had this chronic insertional Achilles tendon uh, pain and a fairly prominent Haglund's bump uh, for quite some time. You know, after failure of prolonged course of uh, non-surgical treatment, um, we looked at to kind of move forward with uh, surgical treatment. You can see on her uh, radiographs, she has a fairly prominent Haglund's with also some um, insertional spurring. And then on her MRI on the bottom right, not only does she have a moderate amount of uh, tendinosis present, you can see that thickening at the insertion, some uh, intra-substance signal changes, but also a fair amount of edema at her uh, calcaneus with uh, retrocalcaneal bursitis. Next slide. So when we treat these uh, patients, uh, we find that the central Achilles splitting approach is uh, really kind of it gets to uh, the meat of the problem. It um, and you kind of do your midline incision and then um, then dissect right down to the Achilles and straight down uh, to bone. Peel the Achilles off both medially and laterally, and I think that's uh, where you'll be able to address the degenerative tendon best. Um, it exposes it uh, very very nicely. Now, all the degenerative tendon is excised. Um, we perform the calcaneal exostectomy um, as well, because you're gonna decompress the posterior aspect. And then um, once you, um, uh, after we do our decompression, you repair your uh, midline split. Now we'll typically place the Ardalon flex band within that midline split and incorporate that into the repair. And again, it does add a lot of substance and, um, and strength uh, to the repair, especially in those cases where you have to debride a lot of tendon. Um, so I think it is a nice way to augment uh, the repair, make you feel uh, very, very comfortable uh, in, in your repair and you don't have just this little thin shell of uh, healthy tendon. I think this also will uh, prevent uh, the need for a much, much bigger uh, procedure like an FHL tr transfer um, and as well. Um, and then we repair back down uh, the Achilles to its insertion with the um, Ardalon uh, graft as well, utilizing your suture anchor of choice. And we'll typically do a double row type of uh, uh, repair. So postoperatively for all these patients, uh, whether it be an acute repair, something chronic, or even non-insertional insertional tendinosis, we're uh, typically seeing these patients at one to two weeks postoperatively. And as long as their swelling and incision look good and healthy, we'll place them into an Achilles boot with about a 20 uh, to 30 degree heel wedge. And then we'll uh, begin gradual weight bearing at, at that time. We feel fairly comfortable uh, with the uh, strength of the uh, repairs and, in, um, in, and with the augmentation uh, preventing any sort of gapping or any sort of uh, creep at the, the repair site. At six weeks post-op, these patients uh, are, are still in their boot. We gradually remove their heel wedges, uh, but start usually formal physical therapy at that time. Um, and then um, gradually transition them out of, out of their boot into normal shoe, sometimes a brace um, at around nine or 10 weeks post-operatively. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to end um saying that uh, the Ardalon has really been a game changer for us in terms of soft tissue reconstruction, specifically around the Achilles tendon. And what's, what's uh, used to be challenging cases in the chronic situations are now um, more predictable. And, and our post op protocol has evolved as we've become more comfortable with the strength of the repair. And we can now treat a chronic reconstruction augmented with Ardalon as if it was an acute because the, the primary initial strength is excellent. It maintains its strength and maintains the continuity and we can begin an aggressive early rehabilitation. So it's really been a, a, a very great tool uh, for Achilles tendon reconstructions uh, in our practice. So Dan, you can conclude. 
Yeah, so in conclusion, we feel that um, the Arulan provides a strong, a reliable, and kinematically permissive augmentation to Achilles tendon reconstruction in acute and chronic uh, reconstructions. Um, it's capable of enhanced resistance to reconstruction laxity, and again, prevents that creep, uh, prevents any gapping at our repair sites. And then its technology is safe, it's effective, it's uh, versatile product to have in your armatorium, even in a lot of these difficult clinical situations. And like uh, Steve said, it's been really um, a, a game changer in our practice. All right, well, so with that, um, it's going to kind of end the presentation piece. I know there were some AV struggles. I, I, I just, man, every time I do these, I just can't help but get snake bit. But um, we got some questions coming in, and um, we'll, we'll start addressing some of those. If you have other questions as you're um, you know, that come to mind, please submit them, and uh, and we'll go go from there. Uh, so first question. When uh, you, you, your torn uh, tendon is sutured back together and wrapped or boxed by Ardalon, is the suture drawing the ends together, uh, not pulled as tight? Um, I could take that one. So I don't think, so, so no, I uh, typically do my uh, standard Achilles uh, repair. I tie the suture uh, fairly tight. Um, I think it's very, very difficult to over tighten an Achilles tendon. I'd rather them too tight than, than loose. Um, when I add the Ardalon to it, uh, I'm not pulling that, you know, when I tension it, I don't tension it as tight as uh, the Ardalon can go. Uh, usually you, you, you pull it about 20, 30% uh, of, of its tension, um, which should give it still a fair amount of uh, strength. So no, I, don't, I uh, still tighten, um, you know, and perform my Achilles repairs as is. Um, and I just add the uh, flex band to it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th I think you have to remember that the Ardalon is used as an augmentation, uh, not as the primary repair in this particular case. So it's a load sharing device. So your primary repair is number one and your Ardalon uh, adds a significant improvement to it, but it's not your primary repair. Uh, question two, what percentage of disease tendon would you recommend using our lawn for the mid substance. Kind of um, I don't know if there's any hard and fast rule. I think a good number is 50%. That's a reasonable number. I think a lot of it comes down to clinical judgments. Some uh, people have very small wimpy Achilles tendons. And in those tendons, I'll lean more towards our lawn. We all, it's nice about our lawn, it has a great shelf life. So the rep with the hospital always has it there for me. And if I'm, if I'm leaning one way or another, I would rather lean to augmentation because that will improve my results and improve my rehab. So I would say a nice, big, healthy, beefy tendon, if 50% of it is gone, uh, I'll use it. Um, but that's, that, that, that's really a, a soft guide. It's really more of a feel, how big the person is, how big the tendon is, how fast you want to rehab them. And I would use it more times than not. I can't remember the last time I did an FHL transfer for a... Uh, mid-substance Achilles tendon tear. I mean, that, and that was my primary procedure for years. Uh, now, if I'm at, at uh, any decision tree making, I'll just set uh, the art on and, and not do the FHL transfer. I would agree with that completely. All right. Any other questions? Um, I know you, you'd mentioned um, changes to your uh, post-op protocols and uh, some of the, the things that you, you, you're able to get more aggressive. Um, for those that are, you know, the naysayers out there, how much of that is 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 100% Ardalon or could it just be accomplished with any kind of material or is it, uh, you know, uh, it, you guys, certainly seem to improve in that area. It, it, are you augmenting more now or is it that you got a better material or is it all of the above? So I think um, 
Um, I think if you go back to that uh, biomechanical study we talked about with the Achilles repairs, um, you know, it showed that your non-augmented uh, groups tended uh, to, uh, you know, they, they gapped more. So, so I think the thought behind a lot of this is that, you know, a lot of these repairs are going to, there's going to be some creep or there's going to be some gapping uh, and we don't know really who that's going to necessarily occur in. Uh, so we, we, we know we want to be aggressive with rehab, but we don't want to compromise our repair. I think, um, so I think that, you know, your Artelon is something that uh, can, you know, just make you more confident in uh, rehabbing these, but, but less than the likelihood of gapping <coughs> compromising your repair. I think the mechanical properties of it are what make it unique. Um, you know, it's strong. It, it is that creep resistant, uh, but it's also inert compared to, you know, some of these other graphs. Um, and it has, you know, a lot of your kind of ingrowth uh, properties and uh, as well. So I think that's what makes it attractive in these cases. Right. I'll add one more thing. I think one thing that changes our post-op protocol, I know, Jesse, that's how you started this question, um, comes down to a little bit of experience you know, as we're doing this for longer and longer, we feel more and more comfortable uh, with our repairs, we feel more and more comfortable with our patients and our selection. And number two, we just ask questions I and mean, we talk to our colleagues around the country. So, you know, formats like this where uh, two guys who've done this a lot uh, stand up and tell us their experience and, and, and they're honest authors, well, that will change uh, potentially what we're going to do. So I think that's how things evolve through webinars like this, through articles like this, through peer public, you know, publications. We're going to have papers that are going to be coming out over the next few years uh, using this material and using accelerated rehab. And I think that's the trend in orthopedics in general. So I, I would say the, the material itself and the experience of others and, and ours has uh, led to evolving post-op protocol changes. Very good. Uh, a couple other questions. Um, this is a good one. Um, Angela asks, have you changed your techniques since the first time you used this? And maybe to broaden that, from how has this evolved, both from across many indications, but even the ways that you use it? I, you know, I recall the first time I saw you guys do this uh, intra substance, you know, for a, for a, um, insertional um, and, and just super novel kind of thing. And that seems to be have been a progression. Can you kind of comment on how you've gotten maybe more creative or? or Along the way. Uh, I can take that. So um, let's see. One thing I think I've done, um, I've I split the tendon uh, pretty much down the middle, and I try to bury the tendon. It becomes a core, a core to the native Achilles tendon. So I'll secure it distally into the calcaneus, or I'll secure approximately, and, and I'll and as I'm suturing my Achilles tendon back, I'll incorporate that the Achilles tendon repair into the artelon as its core. So I've, I've recreated a, a central portion of the Achilles. Um, I think that's changed my technique a little bit as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's just, uh, you know, more indications. Uh, I think our indications have kind of broadened a little bit. And, um, and I think a lot of that is because we've had fairly good uh, clinical results. Um, you know, initially for my uh, acute repairs, um, I, I would just typically, you know, kind of, you know, suture on one side and suture on another side. Um, you know, with, with your box technique, I think that's kind of evolved a little bit where that, you know, actually will incorporate into the tendon a little bit more because we, you know, kind of do your trans Achilles tunnels. Um, um, but I think, I think just our indications have ex expanded a little bit or um, for the, your different types of Achilles tendon pathology. Yeah. So we've got, got a few more coming in. Uh, would you ever consider Ardalon as a standalone or a bridge? Um, usually there's some biology around that you could incorporate. I mean, I've done extensor tendon repairs, answer tibial tendon repairs. Even in the chronic cases, there's always a sheath or some native tissue around it. Um, I'd be a little hesitant to use it alone by itself. I just, I like that how the biology will grow into the Ardalon. But, if you need to, you need to. I just, we just really haven't, you know, found that to be the issue. Um, I, I, I have, but, but rarely. Um, and again, if you can, if you do have some, uh, like Steve said, if you do have some other biology, um, you know, I, I do think that's helpful. Um, you know, I think we saw that, that Achilles tendon uh, case that got infected. 
Um, you know, we, I used that to uh, bridge a fairly, fairly large gap, but that was in addition to your, to your FHL transfer. Um, so, so um, have I done it? Yes. Uh, often, uh, uh, no, no. Yeah. Next question. Um, do you ever consider copulation of the tendon as well when implementing Ardalon on your resection of your chronic uh, tendinosis cases? I mean, what do you mean by copulation? Lenny, you may have to type in. I'll go to your second question. Um, his second question, and maybe you can give clarity. Uh, second question was, has, has there been any studies comparing the strength uh, with Ardalon, whether it's in the uh, patch, you know, burrito technique versus, um, let's see, pig and blanket type applicant. Oh, that's that's around. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Now I see what they're saying. So so you're referring to <clears throat> the technique that we do, where we we lie the gardalon as kind of the core of the Achilles tendon and um, pigs in a blanket type, as opposed to wrapping it around the outside. Um, you know, we have to think about the blood supply of the Achilles tendon. The blood supply comes from anteriorly; it comes from the outside in. So theoretically, you want to have biology on the outside so the blood supply can get to it. Um, so I, I have not done that technique where I wrap it around the outside. I'd be, as Dan talked about in his, his part of the talk, you don't really want to uh, dissect out anterior to the Achilles tendon because that's where the good blood supply is. And, and in order to wrap it around significantly, well, you're going to need to wrap it around and dissect it more. So I think tendon splitting, putting the tendon as the core of the Achilles is, is, a, uh, uh, is a better technique. And studies will follow. Stay tuned. Just from a hand link perspective, I do know as well when, when you when you're wrapping like burrito style, you also lose the ability to alter tension. You know, you just really all you can do is wrap it, tie it down. You can't you know pull up on it or, or adjust anything, which is kind of a nice piece of uh, you know when you have a shoestring type construct, you really have more control to pull on things. Correct. Um, next question. There was a case presented that had previous PRP injections. I think that was you, Dr. Pedica. Um, do, you, do you guys ever incorporate uh, bone marrow aspirate or PRP with this material? Uh, and if so, anecdotally, any comments on faster integration or, or better results? You know, I, I, I generally do not. Um, you know, I, and um, for no particular reason. I mean, it would make some sense by, you know, biologically, if you add more biology to it, you know, with your BMAC or your PRP. Um, and you, you, you certainly could, because I think that would be absorbed. Um, but I don't have any specific uh, real uh, experience with that. I've, um, I've used it multiple times with BMAC, uh, but I haven't studied whether it incorporates faster or slower. Uh, that's another study that will come forward as well one day. Good deal. Any anybody else? That's, that's uh, I think we're we're caught up with that one, and we're a minute before eight. So, I'll uh, looks like there's one on the bottom, Jansen, about uh, the repair of the peritoneum and do the augmentation procedures become difficult to close the peritoneum? Um, I got you. So again, if, if you're using the tendon as a core in the inside of the Achilles, then no, it makes no difference at all because you've you've resected the diseased avascular portion and you're repairing and you're replacing it with this very strong arm core. So it doesn't make it any bulkier. And, uh, and in Dan's uh, box weave technique, he talked about you're putting the box on the medial lateral side, not the anterior posterior side. So it doesn't affect, it doesn't create much bulk to it. Again, it's a very thin uh, material. I would agree. I haven't had any um, um, issues. I think if you if if you have it in the right spot, um, you know, for your box weave technique, um, it, it, you shouldn't have uh, much difficulty closing it. Do you use the same size graph whether you box weave or use this core? Uh, in general, yes, and you will usually use your uh, 0.5 millimeter uh, uh, graft. I think uh, you can do a 0.7. I've done it, but it it, it does add a little bit more um, to it. So I think the 0.5 uh, centimeter size um, is is fairly fairly adequate for your box weave. Um, and then with uh, something you know 
you know, with more of the chronic tendinosis, it, I, th I think it depends on how much tendon uh, uh, you take um, um, or, or how much you have to excise. So um, a 0.5 or 0.7 would be adequate. Um, you can certainly also just double up, you know, um, you know, because the Ardalan uh, is, I think, about seven centimeters or so, I think, in size, if I, um, if I have my measurements correctly. So you can fold it in half if you feel like you need more or if you need something thicker. Um, so, so that's an option as well. Yeah, that's a good that's a good commentary. Sometimes, if you're doing a, the weave, sometimes it just may take more length. Um, so you may need a longer piece to go all the way around things. Whereas if you're in the core, you might be able to get away with just an eight versus a sixteen, something like that. But width wise, usually the the point seven in all things um, foot and ankle, or the point five in all things foot and ankle, it seems to be our ger general workhorse. And you have these exceptions where the 0.3 or the 0.7 makes sense, but day in day out, that 0.5 uh, is is pretty you know, utilitarian. All right, um, great questions, great um, engagement. Um, thank you guys for for making time tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and and, and call it a night, but look for the emails tomorrow. Um, our, our visiting physicians. Uh, once again, I know you had a lot of options tonight. Thank you for, for spending some time with us. So uh, if you have questions after this, uh, you'll, you'll, you've got emails from Ardalan. If you reply to those, they come to me. So if you've got any other further questions or, or want to follow up with, with either one of these gentlemen, um, don't hesitate to reach out. We, we can facilitate that. So thanks again, guys. Have a great night. Thanks, Dr. Newfield. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Have a good one. Be safe. Great. Thanks, everyone.